Okay, esteemed panelists, would you please introduce yourselves to us? Yeah, hi, I'm Krista. She, they is good or really anything that makes the joke land if you wanna to refer to me otherwise. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm gonna be a fifth year PhD student in the human genetics program. Um, I came in through PIBS, which is this umbrella program in biomedical sciences though, if anybody here is part of PIBS. Hello everyone, my name is Wami Ogumbi and I am a, okay, so this, uh, fourth year in the robotics PhD program uh, and hopefully my last year. Um, the hesitancy was because like, I joined in the mechanical engineering program in 2017. So technically this is my, what, seven, six? I don't know how to do math. Um, yeah, year in grad school, um, but yeah. Hi, my name is Shell Jones, and I am um, going to be a 10th year in sociology. Um, I'm from the city of Chicago, so if anybody's got Chicago connections, I always like to know that. Um, and I'm looking forward to learning more from Krista and Wami. Okay, thanks, y'all. So I'd like you to share with us what you wish you knew your first year here. Yeah, um, I mean, the main thing I wish I had a better sense of when I was starting is that grad school can be so incredibly isolating, especially at a big school like Michigan. So you're across all these different campuses and you're in all these different departments. And that means it can be kind of hard to find other queer students. And it doesn't mean that there's anything like wrong with your program or anything like that. It's just kind of what happens if you're in a small program um, and you're one of maybe like two students that are queer in your department. And it sort of means that you're going to end up having different friends in different areas of your life. And you might have to work harder to find other queer students and those queer communities, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. You just might have to look in different places. So yeah, that's the main thing I wish I knew. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, well, I guess my my piece of advice here is like probably not even like, uh, I guess even LGBT uh, specific, but in general, um, uh, the what I wish I knew my first year was to find mentors and sponsors beyond just my advisor uh and um I mean that for many reasons um but one of the most I guess key reasons is that for example if you're like in a situation where um uh, your advisor is unable to help you or does not want to help you it's very important to have other professors especially um who know you and who are willing to go to bat for you um and, and help you through that situation. Um, and um, I mean, I guess I'm being uh, vague here, but like it helped me specifically because like I joined in one program, the mechanical engineering program um, and things didn't work out. And part of the reason that I'm able to continue on in my grad school experience um, to be in the robotics department right now is because I, I was able to cultivate those relationships with um, um, other professors um, so I would say, yeah, definitely finding mentors and sponsors beyond just your advisor um, can really be very helpful. Yeah, and I would say that I wish that I'd known that there were more faculty that were LGBT and first gen. Um, they weren't very visible to me in my department, but they're definitely there. And as time went on and I came to be more aware of which faculty and which peers were LGBT, it was, um, you know, really nice to have that point of connection that we're family, you know, and that point of connection, I think, helped me cultivate that sense of belonging. That's really important. You know, like Krista said, it's very isolated. It can be very isolating in grad school. And as Wami was saying, you know, having mentors or, you know, other points of contact besides your advisor is really helpful. So I've noticed some faculty um, put like safe zone stickers on their doors or, you know, do things like that to kind of signal. But um, the Spectrum Center has a list of faculty that are willing to be contacted um, for identity related issues. So the Spectrum Center is a good resource also for finding out, you know, who our queer faculty are. Thanks, y'all. So now that 
we know a little bit about what you wish you'd known in your first year. Can you share what you wish you had done in your first year? Yeah, so I guess sort of similarly to what we were saying earlier, it's a big campus and there's a lot of things outside your department, like advisors and other faculty and things like that. And a lot of like the resources and events just aren't advertised very well. It can be sort of hard to find them. So I, what I wish I had done was maybe be a little bit more proactive about reaching out if I need a specific resource and also don't give up if you don't find it immediately because something you might not find with one center you might be able to get from another and things like that. So yeah, my best advice would be how to all of the different mailing lists and get in touch with all of the different people. And you could always like take yourself off of them later. Um, and if, the, if, if you truly can't find some resource that you're interested in, it's really early in your grad school career that you have a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more time and energy to devote towards creating those spaces. Uh, like, for example, there's a lot of school specific LGBT groups, but the program that I'm in, uh, PIBS, it doesn't have one for some reason. And I didn't start really thinking about, hey, maybe we should create one until I just sort of didn't have the bandwidth for that sort of thing anymore. So definitely be thinking about what you want and what you want to see and try to develop those connections early on. Yeah. Um, I agree agree 100% with all of that. Uh, definitely building, uh, that helps to really build community. Um, and I guess like along the same lines of like, you know, like kind of like the self-care uh, narrative, like so one is your support network and like joining organization is a very vital part of that. Um, I would also say like um, um, making sure you're also taking care of yourself. So uh, as our other panelists has, uh, have mentioned, you know, grad school can be, is very stressful and you um, get pulled in a million different directions from your advisor saying like you want uh, um, your advisor wanting a bajillion things from you to your uh, uh, coursework professor saying that they want a bajillion things from you to even your friends and family wanting a bajillion things from you and there's only one of you right um, so it's very important that you um, you know like make sure you take time for yourself um, uh, like, I really wish I had done this more in my first year. Um, I kind of like let myself get thrown into like all these obligations and I forgot to like, you know, sleep, eat and all that other stuff, you know, exercise. I'm doing that now, so that's very nice. Uh, but I didn't do that my first year and it really did shake my foundations. Um, so I um, really wish I, 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 you know, like went in with this mentality of like, um, uh, it, it's good to be present. Uh, it's good to, I guess, like, you know, like, I guess, be responsible and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, if I don't take care of myself, then I'm not going to be able to do anything right. Um, so really, self care is very important. Uh, find a therapist too, because <laughs> I think you need that in grad school. I love my therapist. <laughs> I have to echo um, the therapy advice. Um, one of the first spaces that I wish I, one space that I wish I would have known about my first year and I would have gotten involved with is um, CAPS has these like lunchtime programming for LGBT folks. Um, there's like, I think it's called like Concerted Connections or something like that. Um, and it's like a program where you can meet other students that identify. They don't do this only for LGBT students. They've got it for like Black men in academia, I think is one. Um, and anyway, um, CAPS, the, what does CAPS stand for? Counseling and Psychological Services, I think. Um, I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, there we go. Yeah, so I wish I would have, um, you know, known about that earlier. And another thing that I wish I would have done my first year is um, just be more assertive with sharing my ideas. I think that I was 
hesitant to talk to a lot of faculty in the department, but the truth is that your first year is the best year to do outreach to a lot of faculty in the department, because even if you sound dumb, you can always fall back on the fact that you're a first year, and also you're not going to sound dumb. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess my advice is that it would be great beyond your advisor, beyond the professors of the classes you're taking, like try to set up a 20 minute office hour session with other faculty in the department just to get to know them and to voice your ideas and what you want to research, your ideas for the department, your ideas for how to cultivate LGBTQ community in the department, you know, whatever these ideas might be, um, you can share them out with uh, faculty more widely than I did as a first year. Hmm. Okay, thanks, y'all. I appreciate that. So now that we've discussed what you wish you had done in your first year, would you share with us the best things that helped you when you first got here? Yeah, so well, I mean, one thing we keep coming back to is just being proactive about reaching out and finding different people in different communities. And when I came to Michigan, I really specifically wanted to find a group for asexual individuals because I'm asexual and I sort of figured that out a little bit before grad school. And I really wanted to find a community like that. And I ended up landing on um, this program through the Spectrum Center called Center Spaces. And these are a bunch of different identity groups that's run by the Spectrum Center, which is the Queer Center. I hope we said that at some point. Um, and this was a big help for me also because they were sort of restarting the group the first year I was here after a bit of a hiatus. So I've been able to help with getting that up and running. Um, there's a bunch of different ones. I'm, yeah, Center Spaces Rock. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat so you could kind of get a look at them. Um, they've got Ace Arrow, Trans Non-Binary Agender, uh, Bipan Fluid, BIPOC, um, Postdocs. I think that's most of them. Um, so if you're interested in anything like that, you can contact the people who run them directly. I do want to add, though, the Spectrum Center is kind of going through an overhaul. <laughs> they made a lot of new hires in the past year. And part of the thing I think they're going to be looking into changing is how the center spaces run. So if you're interested in any of that, I would get in contact with them sooner rather than later, just so that you're in the loop with all the changes that'll be happening and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the best thing I did my first year. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, we definitely like, I hit, hit, hit on this issue a lot. I think friends community, that is like the, the best thing that helped me get, uh, get through first year. Um, as far, I guess, like as coming into my own, my, uh, identities though, um, I guess I, hmm. I guess this is how like I guess the pandemic in a way kind of helped me because like I wasn't really out when I first came in to uh, Michigan, uh, definitely not in 2017 and kind of like was like a little bit uh, tiptoeing out slowly in 2020. In fact, that's when I used to join my first uh, 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 community, uh, queer community here at Michigan, uh, the Go STEM graduate students out in STEM. I think every like uh, kind of like uh, school has like their own thing. So like I think law has like the outlaws or something like that, some very cool name. And then like there's like business and like all the others. But in College of Engineering, it's ghost them. Um, I guess engineering science, it's ghost them. Um, and yeah, so like um, finding that community really helped me. Uh, Chris already mentioned the the center spaces too was a very important part of uh, my own journey. Um, and all things that I did not definitely didn't do my first year because like I was too scared. <laughs> um, but really, I, I think um, um, it was definitely like one of the best things that uh, happened uh, to me. So like I think uh, joining those spaces um, can really uh, help improve your experience here in Michigan. Yeah, I think this advice is all really good. I also want to drop drop a link to where you can check out if your school or department has a queer affinity group, because surprisingly, you know, more than I would expect do have affinity groups. Um, our question was, what was the best thing you did first year? OK, I'm going to cheat and tell something that I did second year, which was um, I established an LGBTQ um, group kind of in my department. We called it community. Um, 
and TEA because we would get together and have tea and, you know, spill the tea, right? Um, <laughs> this, is, this is me being personable on, on Zoom. Um, but uh, it was one of the best things that I did. I think, you know, if you, if you see the space where a resource could be that doesn't exist, it's worth talking to your director of grad studies about how to get involved in the department. So I did that through a program that my department had called Grad School and Beyond, which was just sort of professional development programming for our department. And it was a lot of fun. And f through organizing this um this affinity space, we kind of came to realize that at the time, about a third of our under uh, a third of our graduate population was identifying in some way on the queer spectrum. So it was also really cool for just realizing how many more of us there were than we realized, because as grad school goes on, you start to become less and less engaged, I think, unless you really make the effort to stay involved. And so students that are after their um, students that are all but dissertation who are dissertating tend not to be around very much and they tend to be the people that have the best career advice the best um, advice about faculty and so getting to know them and particularly getting to know them through affinity groups can be really really helpful um, yeah so I think that's one of the, the best thing I did during my second year <laughs> okay Thanks, y'all. I appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, y'all. So we're now going to transition into the Q&A. Um, but before we do, my colleague is going to place our evaluation survey in the chat. And would y'all just do me a favor and open the link now so that you'll have the tab ready and waiting for you when you're done with this session. So remember that we'll move through this Q&A by keeping stack, which for those who missed it, is just going down the line of those who have flagged that they have a question in order of appearance. You can get on stack by, can you still hear me? I know I'm frozen. Okay, great. So you can get on the stack by um, using the raise your hand function, and then I'll call on you when it's your turn, or writing stack in the chat, and I'll call on you when it's your turn, or... <clears throat> writing a question in the chat and I will ask it for you. Please remember to speak slowly so that the closed caption can capture all that you have to say. And also for those who haven't yet, please change your name to the name you registered with so that we know that you're here. Um, and again, I want to remind us that we may not get to every question, but we'll provide the panelists email addresses at the end of the Q&A so that you can reach out with, to them personally with any unanswered questions. Okay, let's get started. Does anybody have any questions? And as we wait, actually, for questions to come in, I have a question for y'all, a more general question about just like work-life balance that is the struggle journey for every graduate student um, as they enter this new chapter in their lives. How have y'all navigated it? What tips and tricks do you have for us? Yeah, um, work-life balance is still something I struggle a lot with, um, just because I like not doing grad school all the time, just for my own mental health, I need to take a break eventually, um, so it's sort of something I'm continually navigating, uh, but Definitely the best advice I have is to be really proactive about your work-life balance. If you want a solid separation, then you need to make that clear and not compromise on that. I mean, of course, it's going to fluctuate where you've got some days you're going to be doing work for like 10 hours and some days you're only doing work for maybe three hours and things like that. But I think... A lot, I see a lot of people come into grad school and just start doing grad school all the time and they get super burnt out. So make sure you don't do that. Don't let your advisor push you around a lot and uh, along those lines. And really a lot of it is very much up to you, which is also something I don't think a lot of people realize coming in. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And um this is like something like I feel like uh, um, uh, I, I heard a lot, especially when I was like uh, even like a first year saying that, like, you know, like, you know, prioritize yourself. Like I just literally I also gave that advice uh, earlier on in the panel, um, but it's hard to internalize those things. Um, and it's 
but it's really important that you do that because like your advisor is probably going to ask you to do like unreasonable things sometimes because uh, like you know deadlines are coming up or I don't know what whatever whatever is going on at the time. Um, but at the end of the day, this is like where I guess like the friends and your community, the support network that you build uh, build uh, really comes into play because um, they're going to remind you what is important in life and hint, it is not research um, because, you know, yeah, the, and the world's not going to end if you don't stay up until 5 a.m. or whatever working on that one deadline. Um, so yeah, I I, I, re I really agree with uh, all that uh, Krista just said just now. Um, something that I've been employing lately is just like having like a, a routine. Uh, I used to be one that didn't really particularly enjoy routines. I like things like to be like kind of up in the air, but it helped really in my case um, because like when I was like trying to combat uh, like unreasonable expectations, um, it gave me like a better avenue to kind of like, uh, I guess, um, I don't know, like justify, like when I say uh, I'm not going to meet at this time or this time because like I'm going to be at the gym or I'm uh, climbing or I'm going to therapy or whatever. Uh, and so like it kind of like invites people to like I like I, I, I dare people to like try to push it back on my self, self care thing because then it makes them look like jerks. Uh, so they don't do it. Um, <laughs> so like I, 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 I've done that like a couple of times where like my like my advisor, for example, would, would like ask for like a meeting and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I can't do it and he's like why i'm like i have therapy and he's like oh oh okay <laughs> and so he can't say anything um so um having like those structures uh like helped me um especially when i, I felt like I, I if i didn't feel like i could like stand up for myself um which by the way you should feel empowered to like be able to like you know like take care of yourself but if you're like me and you're, you're kind of uh you, you can uh sometimes let people like uh, push your buttons a, a little it can help to have like these priests uh um, structured things to say that no, I, I can't do it because, or you don't even have to justify, but your calendar won't let you. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'm a 10th year. And so I'm an advocate for going slow in the PhD, I suppose. Um, one of the ways that I manage my work life balance is I really strictly keep myself within a work week, which is maybe why it's taking well COVID and that is probably why it's taking me forever that in the job market. Um, but um, one of the things that I think is really helpful is to have an idea of like where your time is going. So I like to use an app called Time and I to track my um, time. So I have, so like for instance, for today, I have that I taught for two hours this morning. I have that I um, spent 30 minutes on my email. I spent 30 minutes prepping for class. And then I spent one hour doing peer support service, which is what I categorize this activity as. So so once I started tracking my time, I could see where my time is being taken up. Um, so, you know, am I doing like you might have noticed there was no writing or research activity in my day today. Um, you know, maybe that's something that I want to work on and make sure that tomorrow is a better research day. But I, I kind of firmly believe that tracking your time is a, is a really valuable investment. You know, on, on an app like Time and I, you can customize it for all of the categories and projects that make sense to you. Um, and then it's just a matter of recording things. So um, that's one of the ways that I maintain work-life balance. I have to just plus one everything that Krista and Wami were saying, because those are really good ways to, um, to, to take care of yourself. Um, time work-life balance. I have a partner, so that helps a lot with work-life balance. So, you know, I recommend having relationships outside of academia to kind of keep you balanced. Um, and, you know, find the things that give you a lot of joy. Like if that's going to live on Thursday nights for Pride Night and going to the drag show, or if that's going to North Star Bar for LGBTQ bingo, you know, whatever it is, um, find the things that make you happy and give you joy and make sure that you center those in your life. Thanks, y'all. Um, I definitely agree with everything that's been said. Um, I have another question for you. What is the biggest thing that surprised you about um, being 
queer at Michigan, queer in grad school, um, a queer grad student. Um, what what did you not expect in your journey here? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, hmm, I guess, all right. I expected Ann Arbor to have a better queer scene. <laughs> I came from I came from Washington DC so like maybe I should have tempered my expectations a little bit but while I was in DC I um I play saxophone I was in a queer band that was part of the pride parade every year and we do all the local ones and stuff like that and then I came to Ann Arbor and we don't have a pride parade we've got pride on Saturday actually if you're into that um but it's a lot it's it's a lot smaller than the DC one for sure. And even uh, in Pride Month itself, Ypsilanti has Ipsy Pride, which is the next town over, and their Pride celebration is a lot better than Ann Arbor's. And when I was moving here, everybody kept telling me, "Oh yeah, Ann Arbor is such a cool, queer friendly place." Um, it doesn't have a ton going on, even though there's a lot of queer people in town, which was very surprising to me. But yeah, my best advice um, is to look outside of Ann Arbor, look at Ipsy, look at Detroit. I've never been to Motor City Pride. I've heard it's really cool, um, but you might have to go a little bit out of the you know convenient campus area if you want to find a lot of really cool queer events. Oh gosh, yeah, that is a hard question. What is the biggest thing that surprised me? Uh, I don't know. So like I grew up in Alabama, um, so uh, I guess like most of my I guess like um, whole queer journey has been like mostly just like you know, I don't know like like just like hiding that part of myself. Um, so like it wasn't necessarily even something that I was like even like looking out for when I first came here in Ann Arbor. Uh, I was more I guess concerned about like the whole like I guess. Uh, 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 I guess racial situation. So like that was like my m main uh, focus. Um, so like as far as like I guess like uh, yeah, I I, hmm. I guess I mean if anything, maybe the biggest thing that surprised me was like how much of a how I guess like I, I kind of like um, thought like my identity would be such like a big deal, but it wasn't here. Uh, compared to like, I feel like if I like, you know, came out of my hometown, that would have been like more of a big deal, for example. So like, I mean, I guess from that perspective, maybe it probably has to do with like how many, how, how I guess big the community is here, even though like our pride events aren't like the best. Um, I did go to Ipsy Pride a couple of times, so I can confirm uh, uh, what Chris has said, that they know what they're doing. Um, and in fact, that was my first pride uh, event last year and it went again this year so would recommend it's in on in june but yeah i guess i was pleasantly surprised by how many drag events there are there's like at least three groups that are doing drag stuff in the community so there's um I'm going to drop in the chat uh, if you're into drag. Um, Boylesque Michigan does a lot of drag in Ipsy. Um, and then at Live, I think I mentioned this before, but at Live, there's um, Pride Night, which frequently features um, LGBT events. And, you know, just for good measure, one more group that I'll drop in. I, I also found that the, like, the local community groups are really nice. So I previously I put um, Ipsy Rainbow Neighbors and the Facebook group that I just dropped in the chat is called Ann Arbor and Ipsy Non-Binary and Trans Folks. What I like about Ips, uh, Ypsilanti Rainbow, maybe I should put that back in the chat again. Um, what I really like about these groups is people ask great questions. So people will pop in and be like, I need a queer hairstylist or like somebody recently was like, you know, is there is there such a thing as a queer towing company? I need to tow my car. And so like it's a great space for people to um post things they need um there's been people in the community that just step up and organize parties all the time or bonfires things like that and so you'll find those if you're following those facebook groups and i'm sorry to be so facebook centric but it seems like a lot of the organizing is on facebook so um so that might be 
worth checking out. Um, so yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by the drag scene. Um, yeah. <laughs> thanks, yeah, thanks. Um, can you speak to the very natural and very inevitable circumstance of imposter syndrome that <laughs> that is a rite of passage for every grad student <laughs> how have you dealt with it how have you overcome it what tips and tricks do you have for us yeah i think the main i mean i still deal with imposter syndrome let's be honest but the main way i deal with it is like, like you said, it's a rite of passage for everybody. Literally everyone that you talk to has imposter syndrome. And it made it so much easier for me to deal with it when I realized, oh, there's postdocs in my lab that have imposter syndrome and they have, they have a PhD already. And I think they're so smart and things like that. And like my PI, so the head of my lab has some imposter syndrome sometimes and being able to have these different conversations with different people who are mentors to me or just people that I look up to and respect and realizing, oh, you all are going through the same, D does anybody know what we're actually doing? It just seems like nobody knows what we're doing. We're all just sort of floundering around. And that has really helped to sort of give me perspective, I guess, and realize that we're all just kind of floundering around trying to figure it out. And eventually somebody hands you your grad school degree and you just keep on the floundering. Um, so yes, just sort of trying to talk about these things with other people and normalize it a little bit has helped a lot for me. <laughs> ah, yes, my good old friend and Pasha Sanjum. We go way back. <laughs> um, I absolutely agree with everything that uh, uh, Krista said. Uh, it really helps to um, talk to others because you're definitely not alone in this. And um, so I guess like speaking more from my experience. Uh, so having uh, had uh, been removed from my first program here at Michigan, definitely reinforced the imposter syndrome because to me that was like tangible proof that like, oh, I definitely am not smart enough to get a PhD here because I literally was removed from my uh, department. Uh, but uh, so there's a couple things, I guess, um, that helps um, to, I guess, that helped me to navigate this. Um, so one, of course, being like community support, mentors, advisors, um, sponsors, all these people um, who are who will be there for you in your in not even just your, your highest moments, but also in your lowest moments uh, to remind you, hey, no, you do deserve to be here. Um, you worked your butt off. Uh, you're smart. You're capable. Um, so that hearing that message when you definitely don't believe it at the time uh, can help you, I guess, keep going forward. It helped me keep going forward. Um, and then uh, that's here also like you know like. Um, having like you know like the uh, i guess a bunch of uh, or having doing things that you enjoy that is not research um i mean if you enjoy your research awesome but that cannot be the only thing that you enjoy <laughs> please don't uh so like for me it was finding like rock climbing so like it's a really good rock climbing community here uh i go to planet rock that's uh in uh ann arbor in ann arbor they also have a madison height location in fact i'll drop a link uh, there's also Dino Detroit in Detroit. Uh, unfortunately, all these locations you will need to uh, you need like transportation to get there. But Michigan does have a climbing club, so they I think they do like uh, carpools to Planet Rock. Uh, but yes, um, rock climbing really helped me, um, even with like I guess like the, the whole like confidence thing. So like I was and am still terrified of heights, and yet I still go climbing very <laughs> regularly. So doing things that uh, scare me uh, and then uh, becoming uh, good at it. Uh, well, I'm not gonna say that I'm a very good climber. I'm not, I'm not actually a really good climber, but I am better than I thought I would ever ever be. It really helped um, translate back to like um, my work in lab, because uh, it just gives me, gets me used to doing things that, you know, scare me that, uh, uh, things that like I would feel like oh I should, I'm not get that good at I see my tangible uh, progress in that and that helps translate to like I guess uh, other parts uh, of my life 
Um, but yeah, so like looking back now, like like uh, having like, you know, found like create the structure of support, having uh, incorporate all these other activities in my life. So like rock climbing, going to the regular gym, I do walks. Uh, like I, I do like uh, at least 2000, um, this year's 2023 miles this year. Um, doing all these things has really helped me uh and then looking back and realize recognizing how far you've come also helps so make sure you appreciate your progress uh and like so for me like i ha currently have two master's degrees and i'm about to finish a phd um in robotics about to be the first uh black woman to do so at michigan so um i say that is pretty cool so take that imposter syndrome I love that advice that Wami just gave, and I want to just echo it a little bit. Find and celebrate every small thing. See, when you get the revise and resubmit on your article, celebrate it, because that's not a rejection. <laughs> that's a revise and resubmit. That is that is on your way to published. Um, but really find a way to celebrate every small thing that happens. You know, I, I, I applied for a grant. I get to celebrate with a beer or, you know, whatever it is for you. Um, you can find me at Ashley's in the afternoons. <laughs> um, Ashley's is my, is my like watering hole. You know, we live in a town where after 3 PM beer is cheaper than coffee. So that's, you know, something interesting. <laughs> I see Catherine laughing. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but I also want to share a story. So imposter syndrome has been a big part of my time in grad school school. Um, I'm first gen, so I face a lot of first gen related imposter syndrome. I'm queer. I experience a lot of queer related imposter syndrome. And I had my queer card pulled by a colleague during my second year, and it devastated me. So what happened was um, when I first came to campus, I was comfortable being out about my pansexuality, but I wasn't, I didn't no, I didn't feel safe to be out about having a non-binary gender identity, and it took me a couple of years to feel comfortable sharing my gender identity with my colleagues and um, folks. So what had happened was um, there was somebody in my program who had a research interest in passing, and so she knew that I was in a relationship with a, with a man, and so she asked me, like, you know, what do you, she's asked me something like, how, how, how do you feel about being in a straight passing relationship? Something like that. And just all of a sudden it was like my queer card got pulled. I was like, oh no, like I do all of these things to try to like be part of the community and I need the community. And I just feel like such an outsider right now. It made me feel so stupid. But the good thing was that it propelled me into therapy <laughs> because I was like, I, you know, I clearly have some unre unresolved stuff if this is bugging me so much and so under my skin. So I went to therapy and you know one of the things that I learned from therapy that's really valuable is that no one is an authority on you you know that's an important thing to remember and it helps with imposter syndrome because you spend imposter syndrome is like spending all this time thinking oh my advisor is not going to think I'm smart this that the other you have to remember that nobody's an authority on you you're the authority on you and what you do and what work you do is what you put out there in the world and that's all you can control you can't control what other people think and what they think doesn't matter that much um but to, so that's two pieces of advice. And then my third piece of advice is, you know, remember that you have skills. Um, this is kind of similar to what Wami was saying, but um, I sometimes pull up my CV and take a look and just remember, here are all of the conference presentations I've given. Here's the service I've done. You know, I've got two master's degrees, you know, I'm this, that, the other, and just really um, taking the time out to remember that you have skills is important. But my fourth piece of advice on this topic is that you need to remember that academia is a flawed structure. It was designed and built for people that are not us for the most part. So academia needs to expand to fit our whole selves. And that's actually a slogan that I have written on right above my um, monitor on my um, little I have a board where I have like little messages to myself and I print out the cover sheet of my publication so that I have like just this board of stuff right above my computer so that when I'm like sitting there and want to cry because writing is so hard, <laughs> I can look up and say like, 
I wrote two articles already. I did that, you know, I, and my slogan, academia needs to expand to fit our whole selves is right up there. So when I'm feeling imposter syndrome, like dig its, you know, ugly head up in my life, that's kind of what I do to try to, those are my four points on how to try to deal with it. So I love that. I do. Um, uh, along the lines of like celebrating small things, I found that so every month I reflect on the month and what I accomplished. And these would th these would not necessarily be things that I would remember, um, like at the end of the year, when you reflect on the year and what you've accomplished. And so they, it feels so much better to say like, you know, I, I put on this thing or I attended this or I wrote like a chapter do you know what I mean but then like because six months it's just like oh I've only like written like two and a half chapters but I've revised and edited and do you know what I mean um and it makes things seem much more I I can keep track of how much I have done which is a lot more than reflecting at the end of the year and it's like wow I've made like no progress in my in my degree at all <laughs> what have I been doing and so but like I have like there's three or four things that I have done every month um that have not just been like academic accomplishments. Like they've been for me, like I got better. I like, I don't know, responded to this trigger in a different way. And I like write that shit down. And then at the end of the month, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, look at that. And then at the end of the year, oh, you have so much, <laughs> you have so much to look, reflect on and be like, wow, I actually grew this year. Um, and these were none of these things I would have remembered if I hadn't written them down. So that's my piece of advice. Um, I want to ask y'all, what's it like being queer in your department? Um, does it matter? Uh, do you tell everyone that you come across? Like, do you feel the need to come out? Uh, to um, have you have you transitioned while being in your department? Did that matter? How did that how did that um, how did that experience go? Um, are there certain people that you knew you do need to tell your queer identity to versus others? Um, yeah. All right, I'll get to, I'll answer the question, but also it's so funny to me, we're talking about imposter syndrome. I'm apparently the only panelist without multiple master degrees. So like, okay, y'all, <laughs> all y'all overeducated for this. All right, um, all right, being clear in my department. Um, yeah, it's, I'm in genetics and you would think being queer doesn't matter if you're in Genetics, it started mattering more and more because for some reason, a lot more people are trying to study the genetics of same-sex behavior. And every time there's a paper that drops about this, whether I find out about it or whether I want to find out about it or not, there's always someone in the department that asks my opinion on it just because I'm queer. And I find that so unbelievably annoying because if you're queer, you're not necessarily an expert on every queer issue. And if I'm a grad student, I don't necessarily want to find out about all the latest problematic research that's come out about queer people. Because honestly, I don't think queer people need to justify their existence by saying like, oh, there's a gene that makes you queer or like whatever, because that's definitely going to get medicalized and used for gatekeeping and weird things like that. So uh yeah it uh, it does end up mattering because there's not a ton of us that are out and those of us that are out we get asked we get asked questions like this um and i find that so unbelievably annoying um i'm really having said that i'm i'm out but i think really the only people that know sort of specifics about that are maybe those in my lab group um because just everybody else does not need to know about it. I'm a big advocate for do not come out unless you are 100% comfortable with that. Like, I don't care Like, if you need to represent queer people in your field or whatever, it doesn't matter, don't do it uh, if you don't want to. Um, and so a lot of people know I'm queer. They probably know I'm some flavor of non-binary. Um, I think though, I'm probably going to have to come out in a bigger fashion because I also just got top surgery. So in a month, I'm gonna be back in lab and everybody's gonna be like, why do you look different? <laughs> yeah, I'm literally, I'm sitting here in my fancy little compression vest. I don't know if people can see the weird tag I've got, um, but yeah, 
it's a it's a process where I didn't like tell anybody specifically I was getting top surgery. I told them I was going out on medical leave for a month and we're going to see what the reactions are like when I come back. Everybody's been mostly chill about my pronouns, so I don't think it's going to be an issue. But you never know because it's a constantly evolving thing. All right. So sorry. That was a lot. I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> no, that well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, honestly, like that is incredibly frustrating being like uh, being asked um, all these random things just because you're queer and it's just like, anyways, I can, I can go on a tangent too. So like, no, I vibe with that. Um, as far as like my department goes, like I, I guess I'm not really like, I feel like it's like an open secret at this point. Like, I feel like there is like a like a tiny tiny queer community within like kind of robotics there's not like really like a i want to say like an organization well we recently um uh, developed the organization gender gender diversity in robotics uh i, I guess i'm one of the founding members of that uh and we're kind uh, and we've like held events we've like uh, uh, had panel of uh, people come over um and speak about like uh, specifically like uh, robotics issues, uh, especially if they intersect a lot uh, um, with like, I guess, like their queer identities. Um, and like, you know, like, so, so we can like, uh, like, you know, promote like, uh, ethically safe, like robotic stuff, all that stuff. Anyways. Um, yeah, so I guess I don't really, I, I, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm not really out, but like, I'm not really not out, I guess. So like, if people like see that I'm on this panel, like I like it's yeah, but like I don't think like most people know, not even like my lab mates necessarily. Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of here. I'm vibing. And I honestly, I think like I think this kind of goes with like what Krista was saying before, like you don't have to like uh, come out unless you absolutely want to. Uh, and like I, I don't see it necessarily at this necessary at, at this point. I think it's fine for me to exist as I do right now. I'm out to like, I guess the queer community It's the way like I like to see it. So like all the queer spaces that I'm in, absolutely happy to be like my whole self there. Um, but other spaces, you know, I have enough on my mind. Like I'm a black woman, we'll leave it at that <laughs> for now. Uh, you don't need to know anything else, <laughs> yeah. I think I tend to be pretty out about both my sexual and gender identity, as well as my first gen identity. And part of being very out is that um, it helps me find friends that I share this affinity with. Um, you know, affinity groups are really, really great, but, you know, they rely on somebody to run them and do the work. Like, the work Sam is doing today is really, really powerful and important. And I think that um, those spaces let us connect to each other, let us identify our fam. And um, I guess, yeah, I'm pretty out. I now I'm, I, I was closeted until I was 30, so I'm just not going back. And I, I'm out a lot in my field, I think, by virtue of the research that I do and the affiliations that I have also. Um, there's only been really one time that I've had a regret, and it wasn't really about me even. Um, and my regret was that on Facebook and on Twitter, I'm connected to a lot of academics and, you know, people share their stories on social media. This wasn't my story, but um, there was a student in my department who is trans and he shared a story about being trans while flying, basically. And it wasn't even his own story, but somehow a faculty member thought that that had been his experience of traveling while trans and like brought it up in a class and talked about it and like outed this student. And I thought that was really awful because, you know, that that person had gone through transition in grad school, but like the newer cohorts didn't know anything about this. And so, you know, the opportunity 
or the right to to just exist or just be stealth was kind of taken away from this student and it really bothered me so i guess that um my one caveat on being out is that i'm a little more careful about what i post on social media and i have some faculty blocked <laughs> so that we're still connections but they can't see my stuff <laughs> so you know that might you know it's tricky it's tricky finding mentors um that are that are that really get it and do good work so um that's just something to be cautious about i think thanks y'all what ex um someone asks what experience have you had medically transitioning with the health insurance that we get yeah i could take that um basically wasn't a bad experience at all i'll drop you a link to the gender clinic here um so we get pretty good health insurance in terms of gender affirming care. Um, and then I'm going to drop a second link, which is to the graduate student union, because they're currently working on expanding access to trans health care. Um, and, you know, really the main stuff I was annoyed with going through this process was there's a lot of hoops to jump through and it takes some time, which is going to be true of everywhere that you go. Um, but really start to finish with me getting surgery it took less than a year. You've got to sign up for the gender services. It, they take forever to process your paperwork, of course, but then you have to get in your letters of recommendation from uh, mental health professionals and then that takes a bit to process but then you get a consultation with the surgeon and they eventually call you when they're ready to schedule um and all of that was fairly smooth and i'm i got top surgery i'm not a trans man i have no desire to go on testosterone nobody even asked me about stuff like that so it's fairly smooth um and my my partner went through the same thing and he is trans mask and was doing testosterone for a while also had a pretty easy time with it um, I um, can't speak if you're transitioning um, male to female, but I've heard from other people that it's sort of similar experiences. Um, but if you want to get involved in advocating for more trans health, definitely get involved with the union GEO because it's because GEO has fought for a lot of healthcare stuff that we have. It's the reason why it's a fairly smooth process today and they want to expand it even more. So they're doing a lot of um, advocacy work when it comes to trans health, if that interests you. Okay, y'all, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask you to leave us with the biggest piece of advice that you'd like our audience members to hear um, as you, as they start their new journey here. Yes, I'll go again. Um, okay. My biggest piece of advice um, might be sort of obvious, I guess, but like if you get the sense that your research group or your department is queerphobic or transphobic or just doesn't respect you, don't waste your time with it. I've seen a lot of grad students sort of overlook that because they're like, oh, I really want to do this one piece of research and this guy's the only one who does it. So I don't know. I'll just feel like, no, don't do it. Your comfort is number one. It doesn't really matter what you're researching. You're going to hate it in a couple years, no matter what it is. So you might as well be doing it with people who actually care about you and respect you. Don't make yourself like grad school is hard enough. Don't make yourself miserable. Um, so yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's real. I love that. That's a great piece of advice. I, I, 100% agree. Um, my advice is towards the fellow baby gays out there. I say go ahead and buy that first pride flag. If you're too scared to put it up in your home or uh, like, I guess, out and about in your life, that's fine. Do what I did. Put it in your closet. <laughs> it's fine. And then it can slowly migrate out. So like mine is kindly is finally outside in the living room area. So it, it's great. Yeah. But um, it's uh, this. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's my I'll leave it there. 
I say get involved. My biggest piece of advice is find a way to be involved because it's rewarding and it makes it makes me feel whole anyway. So if your way of getting involved is taking on some undergrad research assistance, you know, I've done that and it's fantastic. If your way of getting involved is attending the Spectrum Center's grad student mixer, that's awesome and fun. Um, oh, pro tip, during the first week of camp of like life on campus the spectrum center has events and they have awesome t-shirts i wish i would have gotten my t-shirt my first year but they have really cool t-shirts so uh attend their event and snack one of those up um but yeah just be involved and be good to yourself Okay, y'all, thank you. This is all the time we have for today. The recording of this event will be sent to you once it's been processed. And remember when you get the opportunity um, for a short break, pop over to the evaluation survey so that we can keep improving our programming for you. The panelists' email addresses will be placed in the chat and you can reach out to them if you have any additional questions. Thank you and take care of yourselves. <laughs>